Hi, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and in this video I'm going to go over how to sketch a Bodhi plot. Now as much as I love sketching Bodhi plots, I think the main reason for doing this is to be able to understand how each term in a transfer function affects a Bodhi plot. Not necessarily how to sketch an entire Bodhi plot, but certainly the act of sketching a Bodhi plot reinforces that issue of what the factors of a transfer function do to a Bodhi plot. So there's several different ways to create a Bode plot. We can do it experimentally, we can also do it analytically, and graphically. And this is what we're going to focus on here. And of course we can also use MATLAB. So before we get into the graphical sketching technique, let's take a quick look at how you would generate a Bode plot analytically. If you have some loop transfer function g of s, you simply replace s with j omega. So here's an example. Then Here's the example of g of s with s replaced with j omega. And then you simply find the magnitude of g j omega and the phase of g j omega. So of course the magnitude is the magnitude of the numerator divided by the magnitude of the denominator and boom, there you go. And the phase angle of g j omega is the phase of the numerator minus the phase of the denominator, like so. So you have a few inverse tangents and boom, here's the expression for the phase of g j omega. And then you can just plot these two. Here's a magnitude of g, here's a phase angle of g, both versus omega. Just plot them point for point and there you have a Bode plot. But what we're going to do is the graphical construction technique. And there's just a few steps associated with it. First you want to write your transfer function in what's called Evans form. That's where the coefficient of the highest power of s in each of the factors is equal to 1. You also want to make sure that you've formed your transfer function so that you have only first and second order factors. Here's an example down here where we have real poles and complex poles in second order form. And then you want to identify the number of either poles or zeros at the origin. And again in this example we have uh, one pole at the origin. So after you do all this, a little preliminary activity, then you form what I call a breakpoint table. And that just summarizes all the information that you need for sketching the Bode plot. And here's an example of a breakpoint table. We're going to construct one later, so let's not worry too much about what the details that are in there. After you have your breakpoint table, you want to extract the Bode gain from the transfer function. And this is one way to do it. This is called the Bode form of a transfer function. And here we've factored out all of the coefficients in the lowest power of s so that we have just this quantity in the numerator. And then we convert that into db for the Bode gain. So 7.8125, that's actually closer to 18 db. I think 20 was a rather crude approximation. So just as a reminder where this loop transfer came from was the same example we had a couple slides ago where it was 1000 s plus 1 over s s plus 2 s squared plus 3s plus 64. And so what's happened here is we've factored out the 2 that went to here and we factored out the 64 and that went to here. So 1000 divided by 2 divided by 64 is this value, 7.8. So that gets you your Bode gain. Now there's just a couple more things to do. I'm going to make myself a little bit of room right here so I can illustrate this. What you do is, is you focus on a, just a handful of rules associated with each of the plots. So for the magnitude plots, it goes like this. Here are the two rules for the poles or zeros at the origin. You'll have one or the other, or maybe neither, but not both. So if you have poles at the origin, what you do for the magnitude plot, you identify the 0 dB 1 radian per second point, and you draw a diagonal line through that point with a slope of negative 20 db per decade times the number of poles at the origin. So for instance, if this is the magnitude of g, and I'm making a very crude log scale, this is omega, you identify this point, this is 0 db, 1 radian per second, and then you just put a diagonal line through it, and the slope of this thing is negative 20n, where n is the number of poles at the origin. And if it were zeros in case b here, then it's just a positive diagonal line through that point of 0 dB 1 radian per second with a slope of 20 
db per decade times n, the number of zeros at the origin. So let me erase those two and then go on to these last four steps. So now let's consider if we have poles or zeros that are not at the origin, whether they're real or complex. Remember in the breakpoint table we identified what we called the order. So for real poles, the order might be 1, or if this were raised to this 2, it would be 2, etc. For complex poles, this thing has order 2 just as it stands. If it were multiplied by 2, then we'd say it was order 4. Regardless, what you do is you identify the breakpoint frequency. So let's say it was 10. And what I'll do is I'll actually say that we're going after a factor that looks like 1 over s plus 10. You identify this point, it's flat up until that point, then it goes down to the tune of 20 dB per decade times the order of this factor. So if that were 1, it would go down at 20 dB per decade. If it were 2, it would be 40 dB per decade, etc. And guess what? If it's zeros at the or if it's zeros that are not at the origin, then it goes up at 20 dB per decade positive slope. Now for the phase plot rules, it's a little bit different. For poles or zeros at the origin, what you get is just simply a horizontal line at either negative 90 or 90 degrees. Negative 90 for poles, plus 90 for zeros. So if this was a phase plot and I had 1 over s squared, I would get just a horizontal line at negative 180 degrees. That's it. Now if it's poles or zeros not at the origin, then we have something a little bit trickier. If you remember, even though we just glanced at it at that breakpoint table, actually let me flip back to it. In the breakpoint table, we had these things called phase bounds at omega over 5 and 5 times omega. Basically, there are two frequencies associated with that break frequency for the phase plot. And what you do if you have poles is you identify these two points and you throw a line between them and at 0 at low frequency and negative 90 times n, the order of that factor at high frequency. And if it were zeros, it would go up and then level off. So that's just a real high level explanation of the sketching rules. In a minute we're going to go through these in more detail and then do an example. So here's the steps. You identify all the factors of G of S. Get it sorted out in terms of the number of poles at the origin or the number of zeros at the origin, etc. You calculate the Bode gain. You put into your magnitude plot all these little sub-Bode plots for each one of the factors. And you do the same thing for the phase plot. Once you have all those little mini-Bode plots done for each of the factors, you just add them up. And that gives you the complete magnitude and phase plot. So here's the gory details. So first let's carefully review the types of factors. Poles are zeros at the origin. Here's some examples. This one has one pole at the origin. This has two zeros at the origin. Pretty straightforward. Real poles and zeros. Here's a real zero, and here's a real pole. Complex poles are zeros. There's a complex zero pair, and here's a complex pole pair. In the next few pages, I'm going to go through more carefully the contribution of each of those different factor types to a Bode plot. But the notation I'm going to use is that the factors can either be poles or zeros. But if they're poles, I'm going to use solid lines and zeros dashed lines. And when you're sketching a Bode plot, you don't really do that necessarily. But this is just to illustrate these different factors. And I'm always going to use P for the multiplicity. So here we go. Poles are zeros at the origin. So the factor looks like this. For the magnitude plot, as I said before, it's just a diagonal line, and all you have to do is identify the 0 dB one radian per second point and draw that diagonal line right through it. And of course, it goes on forever like that. And if there's zeros, it's a positive slope. And the slope is 20 times P, P being the multiplicity of that particular real root at the origin.
and for the phase plot contribution this is the phase of G in degrees and this is in DB by the way but for the phase plot it is negative 90 times P for poles and plus 90 times P for zeros and I don't know what that 2 is doing up there but for real poles are zeros so here's what the factor looks like multiplicity again is P this is in DB this is in degrees and if it's a pole at a break frequency of A it's just flat up until that frequency A and then it goes down to the tune of negative 20 times P dB per decade. That means it will have dropped 20 times P decibels between A and 10 times A. That's one decade. If it's a zero, it goes up with a similar slope, but of course positive. The phase plot, now here's where we get some interesting behaviors. You identify these two frequencies, A over 5 and 5 times A. And if it's a pole, you drop 90 degrees times P, the multiplicity, between those two break frequencies. And if it's a zero, you go up 90 times P between those two break frequencies. And finally, complex poles and zeros. You really treat these just like they were real poles and zeros, except you have to identify the break frequency, which in this case is just omega n. So if it's a pole, you identify the omega endpoint at 0 dB, and you're flat up until that point, and then you drop down to the tune of negative 40 times P. If it's a zero, you go up 40 times P dB per decade. And for the phase plot, just like before, except now you're at omega n over 5 and 5 times omega n. And instead of going up 90 times P for a zero, you go up 180 times P for a zero. And that's because for each one of these factors, you really have two poles. And thus, 180 and negative 180. And 40 and negative 40. And now the Bode gain. So there's a couple different ways to do that, so let's consider this example. One way to do it is to rewrite the transfer function in Bode form, where you factor out for instance the 2, the 20, and the 13 and then you end up with this coefficient of the transfer function and then you convert that to dB and boom you've got your Bode gain. Another way to do it is to leave it in this Evans form just like this and then ignore any poles or zeros at the origin and then just multiply the 37, the 2, the 13, and the 20 and then you'll have your Bode gain just like that. And here's the contribution of the Bode gain to the Bode plot. It's probably my favorite one. So the contribution of the Bode gain to the magnitude plot is just a flat line to the tune of the Bode gain. And to the phase plot, it's nothing. Now, one last thing before we get into actually sketching one of these Bode plots. Once you've created a Bode plot, it's always nice to be able to sanity check it, whether you've created it by a hand sketch or with MATLAB or some other tool. And so here's a couple ideas about how to do that. First off, they're broken up in terms of the magnitude plot and the phase plot, and further into high frequency and low frequency behaviors. What that means is, if we have a Bode plot that looks like this, magnitude G, phase of G, this is omega and omega. When I say low frequency, I'm referring to this area out here and high frequency out here somewhere. In this discussion, let's go ahead and consider this transfer function that we had earlier. Let's see, it was s, s plus 2, s squared plus 3s plus 64. At high frequency, the Bode plot's going to ramp off with a slope of negative 20 times n minus m dB per decade, where n is the number of poles and m is the number of zeros. So in this case, it would ramp off at 4 minus 1, or 3 times negative 20 dB per decade. That is negative 60 dB per decade. At high frequency, it'll be going like this at negative 60. Now at the very end of this set of notes, I actually have the Bode plot created from MATLAB of this. So if we look at that right now, what we should see at high frequency in the magnitude plot is a ramp like that at negative 60 dB per decade. 
So here's this ramp behavior. And if we approximate what its slope is, here it's at about 0 dB, and here it's at negative 60. This is one decade, and sure enough, negative 60 dB per decade. At low frequency, if there are no poles or zeros at the origin, it's going to be flat, equal to the Bode gain. Now in this case, we actually have a pole at the origin. So we do know what it's going to be doing there. We know that it should be sloping down to the tune of 20 dB per decade. Since this factor is a diagonal line that goes to the lowest frequency possible. So let's just take a look at that. And sure enough, at the low frequency end, we're sloping like this, and it's about 20 dB per decade going from 20 or from 40 to 20 in one decade. Now for the phase plot. At high frequency, it's going to level off at negative 90 times n minus m, where again that's the number of poles minus the number of zeros. So if we look at our plot a couple pages down, it should level off at negative 270 degrees. Let's check. There it is, negative 270. Perfect. And at low frequency, if there are no poles or zeros at the origin, then the low frequency phase plot will be zero. If there are poles or zeros at the origin, then it's going to be flat at low frequency to the tune of either plus or minus 90 degrees, depending on if we have poles or zeros at the origin. So here we have one pole at the origin, P is one, so it should be flat at negative 90 degrees at low frequency. Well, let's check. There it is, beautiful, negative 90. The interesting thing about all those rules is that you can take a Bode plot like this and immediately understand if it has poles or zeros at the origin, how many net poles and zeros it has based on this slope or this phase, and get quite a bit of information about the transfer function. Okay, so now let's do our Bode plot sketch and we'll use this transfer function that we've been studying a bit so far. So let's go ahead and make the breakpoint table. So we have the breakpoint type. That'll either be P or Z for poles and zeros. The break frequency omega. The order. Zeta. So there's my rather crude looking table. And let's just go after these different pieces. So here's the first pep factor that we'll look at, S plus 1. So it's a 0. The break frequency is 1 radian per second. Order is 1. Zeta is not applicable and omega over 5 and 5 times omega goes like that. Now let's do this one, a pole at the origin. So it's a P. The interesting frequency is 1. I'll put a star by it because it's a little bit different than all the others in the sense that we're going to have this diagonal line through it. The order is 1. There's no zeta. Let me extend these down a little bit. Okay, the next factor is S plus 2. It's a pole. Omega is 2. Order is 1, zeta is not applicable, and omega over 5 is 0.4 and 10. Then we have this, a complex pole pair. It's a pole. The natural frequency is 8 radians per second. Order is 2. Zeta is, let's see, 2 zeta omega n equals 3. Omega n is 8, so this would be zeta is 3 over 16. That's close to 3 over 15, so that's roughly 0.2. And omega over 5 is 1.6, and 5 times omega is 40. Great, so we have our breakpoint table. Let's get our Bode gain. Let's see, the Bode gain is 20 log 10. And I'm going to use this approach where I just ignore the poles and zeros at the origin and just write it as 1,000 over 2, and 64 and that gives about 18 dB. Got it. Now let's sketch in all of our pieces. Okay, so let me do the Bode gain first, and I'll, let's see, on the magnitude plot, that'll be about 18 dB, so right about there. It's sloped up a little bit, but um, it's a sketch, so those sorts of things happen. Um, so let's do the first factor in the breakpoint table. That was a zero, and it had a break frequency of 1 radian per second. So I'll draw a dot there. And then I'm going to slope up at 20 dB per decade. 
and for low frequency it's just zero. Okay, and then we had a pole at the origin, and so for that I have to identify the zero dB one radian per second point, it's that same point, and then I have a diagonal line through that at 20 dB per decade. Like so. And the next factor was a pole at 2 radians per second, so I put a 2 there, or a dot at 2. I'm going to go out to 20 and go down to negative 20 dB because it had a uh, multiplicity 1. So I'm going to be dropping at 20 dB per decade. And I'll fit a line through those. And good, that's parallel to the um, pole at the origin line. They're both 20 dB per decade, so it makes sense that they're parallel. If you're ever making these Bode plots and you find that you have uh, diagonal lines that aren't at 20 or 40 dB per decade, or some multiple of 20 dB per decade, then something probably went horribly wrong. Um, okay, so the last factor had a natural frequency or a break frequency of 8 radians per second. So it puts this here, and then I'll go out at to uh, 80 radians per second and drop down to 40 dB because it's order 2, and I'll put a line between those two things. Great, I think I have all my pieces for the magnitude plot. Now what you do is, is you just start at the low frequency end and literally just add up all the pieces at each of the points in the breakpoint table because that's where something interesting happened. So if I do that at the low frequency, I have a whole bunch of 0, uh, plus 18, plus 20, so that puts me at about 38. I'm going to use a big dot because there is some uncertainty with my sketch, and that puts us right on top of the blue line. And notice what I'm doing here is I'm sketching on top of a MATLAB-generated Bode plot. That's a good way to do this as you're practicing it. So the next point where something interesting happens is at 1 radian per second. There's a whole bunch of zero going on. It's really everything is zero except for the Bode gain at 18 dB, so I'll put a big dot right there. The next point is at 2 radians per second, and I have some zero stuff going on, but also something interesting happens with this line and this line. From here on out, those two contributions to the Bode plot cancel each other. They're at the same slope, and they go through the same point. So I'm going to take my red pen and just draw on top of those just so I know to ignore those pieces. Okay, but at one radian per second, those two red lines cancel each other out, and so we're still at 18 dB. So I'll just put a big dot right there. The next point is eight radians per second, and I have, let's see, 18 dB, and then I drop down that amount, which is not quite 18 dB, so I'm a little bit above zero. So, you know, it's really close to what's on the blue line. Very good. The next point where something interesting happens is way out here. And what do we have? If we add everything up that isn't a red line, so I have 18 dB from this line, and from this one I have about negative 35, and from this one I have oh, about negative 45. So if I add all that up I get negative 62. Well, yeah, that's pretty close to right there. So if I add up or connect up all my big dots I get something that looks very much like the blue computer generated Bode plot. Now let's do the phase plot. So the Bode gain does nothing, and the next factor is a zero at one radian per second. So let's see, I need to know where point two is, and five. In between those two, I'm going to go up 90 degrees, because the order of that pole was one. And zero back here, 
and it's plus 90 to the right of that. The next factor was a pole at the origin, and so that just gives 90 degrees. I'll just go like so. And the next factor was a pole at 2 radians per second. So the break frequencies were 0.4 and 10. So I'll put a dot here, go out to 10, drop down 90 degrees because the multiplicity of that pole at s plus 2 was 1. And connect up those two dots. And it's 0 back there and negative 90 to the right of it. And the last factor was the complex pole pair with a frequency, a natural frequency of 8 radians per second, but the break frequencies were at 1.6 and 40. So 1.6 is about maybe here, and 40 is here. And I went down to negative 180 because the order of that was 2. So it's negative 180 out there, and 0 back there. So I have all the pieces, and now I just have to add them up. And I do the same thing. I start here and start making my way to the right, just adding up all the pieces at each one of those points where something interesting happened. So at the low frequency end, I'm at negative 90. The next point is here, and I'm still at negative 90. The next point is here, and... I am just a little bit above negative 90 to the tune of this distance. So maybe there. The next point is here. And so I'm up this amount and down that amount. So again, I'm above negative 90 by just a little bit if I were to add up all those pieces. The next point that's interesting is here. And now this plus 90 is always going to be canceling that minus 90. So I really don't have to think about those two pieces anymore. So now what I have is maybe negative 70 times 2 or negative 140. So somewhere in this general area. The next point is there. And now a lot of things are starting to end up at their flat lines. So this one is canceling that one, but I also have a negative 90 that just went flat from that line. So I'm at negative 90 plus negative this distance down to that point. And lo and behold, that is right about there on the blue line. That's pretty nice. The next point where something interesting happens is here. And now what we have is a plus 90 and two negative 90s and a negative 180. So I'm actually right at negative 270 and I stay that way even to here. Everything is flat. And look at those dots. I mean they're almost right on the computer generated sketch. Doesn't get much better than that actually. Just to summarize, we went through the contributions of each of the factors of a transfer function to a Bode plot, then showed how you can sketch each of the factors onto a Bode plot and just add them up to get the total Bode plot. But one of the most important things are those sanity check rules that we went over that tell you what the Bode plot does at low frequency and high frequency. And then we did a sketch. So again, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech, and thanks for watching.